So, I'm so excited tonight that we get to have our sister Angie with us tonight to present what has really been such a, uh, a transformational study for me, which is a study of, of spiritism. And 150 years of the gospel now. Wow. It's, it's a lot, but it's a short time, I guess, in, in all of evolution. Uh, but Angie it is going to be telling us a little bit about this history and, and these teachings. I want to tell you a little bit about, about her. Angie's a, a lawyer. She comes to, from Brazil. And she's one of the, the founding directors of Inner Enlightenment. Uh, she does everything, that, so many different activities here at the center. And I've only been witness to her doing them with great love. Um, she's been a dear friend to me and uh, certainly one of my spiritual mentors. And so I ask that you might send her your loving energy, your, your good energies for her presentation tonight, that she might be able to share with us in, in a good way. Okay? Thank you. Like how they cook their food when we talk about the, 
the Jewish, for example, they have all these um, rules, how they clean the food. It, everything came from the time of Moses. And I already knew that Moses was the one who created the law of uh, divorce. But researching about Moses, I found out much more that Moses was a pro-woman. When we think about Moses, we have this idea that was a very masculine and he couldn't care much about the women, but not really. He not seeing that in that time, a lot of people were polygamists. So they embraced the idea of more than one wife, not more than one husband, but a lot of wives. So what was happening? So this husband with the 10 wives, when the older wife <coughs> got uh, even older, what they did? Let's divorce and get like a chew younger. And what happened to this older wife? She was desperate. Because in that time, or you live uh, under your father protection or under your husband protection. So if you already got married, your father is not uh, supposed to take care of you anymore. It's your husband. And if your husband divorced you, you have no money to survive. So they had basically two options. Or they end up becoming beggars and trying to get their own food, or they end up in prostitution. So when Moses saw that, he established rules saying, from now on, you can divorce, but you will have to give a share of everything you have to the wife you will be divorcing. So with the time, men start saying it's not such a good idea to have so many wives because they get expensive. <laughs> so with the time, men start saying, you know, maybe it's better I have less wives, less, less than one wife. And with that, then monogamy came and then a moral involvement. Because when the the men start having this necessity to have so many wives, they start dedicating themselves more to one wife, to the family, and then to their kids. And then continue the time with the prophets. One very famous one was Elijah. And I found out that Elijah, in the time he was here, he was a volunteer from a planet of regeneration. A planet already much, much advanced, much more advanced than Earth now. Imagine from the time that, uh, the, uh, that Elijah was incarnated. And then Elijah returned again, returned again as John of the Baptist. He's still with the same mission. The mission to talk about the Messiah, the Messiah that was going to come to help the world to evolve. He came with the mission to talk about Jesus. And then came Jesus. And Jesus' teachings were what? A very different God that Moses introduced to us. Jesus, God, was a very loving God, a loving of respect, of understanding. So the message of Jesus were very different. But why they could be different? Because we reincarnated many, many times. And in the time of Jesus, we were a little bit better, a little bit better. We still couldn't understand 100% of what Jesus told us, but we were already better people, easier people, than from the time of Moses. And then continued this process, came Kardec, and the elevated spirits that with Kardec, they brought a lot of message to be able to codify spiritism. And then spiritism, where Kardec was able to receive these thousands of messages from many, many spirits, many mediums uh, that brought uh, many spirits that brought the message to the mediums around the world. So you have to understand the messages were in many different languages. It's not the messages were in French because Kardec was French. No, Kardec spoke many languages, too, so it made it easier for him to codify. But at first, he had to translate, to analyze to a group the message by the context, to see if this is a good message, a bad message. So we think that his job was very easy just to take the message and put it in a book. No, it's so much more than that. We will see a little bit how it was. So to talk about the evolution and to talk about that uh, 
the spirituality is always well prepared. And also, they never send a spirit to incarnate if they have a big mission, if they don't have a background, if they are not well prepared for what they are going to be doing. So let's start talking about Young Hus. So Young Hus was a Czech reformer. He was a priest. And he believed in the poor, the, the pure, the pure and simple church, fully connected with the people, and the sermons should be in their language, not in Latin. In that time, the sermons were in Latin. And the priests, they didn't talk to the people. They were just facing the altar all the time, talking in Latin. So can you imagine what you got from this message? Very little, because it's in a language that you do not talk. And the priests don't even face you, don't even look to not even have a question. So I was kind of very detached to the, to the general public. And these were few of the things in Hus was against, many other things, and then brought him inquisition, and they burned him alive in July 6, 1415, in Constance, Germany. And when uh, he was burning, he said this famous sentence, yeah, today burns a duck. In Czech, Hus means duck. But today, but a day will come that a swan of light will fly so high that your flames will not reach it. But uh, anybody knows why I talked about Young Hus? And who is Young Hus? Yes. Nobody knows. Yes, yeah, I know you know. <laughs> so, who is Young Hus? I like her deck. I like her deck. Exactly. So this is just to show you how spirituality is well prepared. We need to know who was Alan Kardec. Was just someone that whoop, came here and uh, did a great job? No. Can you imagine he died for his cause? In the last moment, the Inquisition told him, abjura, I don't know how to say this in English, but it means negate everything you said until now, and you are not going to die. And he said no. And he died because of his cause. So when he returned as Alan Kardec, he was well prepared. So we see it here that the last, later he reincarnates a professor, Denis R. Rivali. And in the time of Kardec happened the Auto de Fé in Spain. And the Auto de Fé in Spain was a situation that the Inquisition took 300 books, 300 spiritist books and they burned the books in a public square. And it was a way of fear, to show fear to the people, saying, do not read this, or we will burn alive like the books. And then Kardec was very distraught, very, very distraught, distressed with the situation. Because, you know, nowadays, books cost $20, but in that time, books were very rare, very difficult to get, especially this kind of books. So 300 books was like a nightmare of losing all this uh, important material. But then the spirits told her that, don't worry, it will be actually positive to the spirit's cause. And then her that is not me that would get totally desperate. He said, OK, so let's see what's going to happen. And then exactly what he said here happened, because what happened? When something is forbidden, we get interested. We want to know it's forbidden. Why? Let me see what is it. Let me read it. So actually really worked in the contrary way that the church wanted. People will start smuggling Kardec books because they really wanted to understand what was so dangerous there. So this thing happened. So the books, they were burned, but the flames could not reach Spiritism. The flames could not reach the spiritist doctrine that was born so strongly in that time. And then here is Kardec. So Kardec was born in Lyon, France, on October 3rd, 1804. His full name is Hippolyte Leon Denisard Ripai. He was well known arithmetic, grammar teacher, writer. He was also many other little professionals. He was a volunteer to teach poor kids about everything he knew. He volunteered his own home to bring 
the, not just kids, but bring adults that didn't know and wanted to learn. Uh, and he was teaching it. He was a student of Jean-Baptiste Pestalozzi, who was well known in Europe by his ways of, uh, his different methods of, uh, of teaching. And then in 1855, he was finally introduced to the turning table phenomenon. So let's talk a little bit the turning table phenomenon. The turning table phenomenon was like the game of the time. They didn't have TV, so nowadays when you want to you know, do something or time, you turn on the TV and you have 500 channels. It's not even in the time of my parents, they had like six. Now you have 500 channels. So they had the turning table phenomenon. It was a game, a game where people got together, they sat around the table, they placed their hands there, and then together, somehow, the table started moving and start producing noises and answering basic questions, yes and no, yes and no. And then, finally, one day, Kardec went and he said, it's not possible. If a table is answering some questions, the table must have a brain. And because I know the table does not have a brain, I have to investigate it. So it's very important that Kardec was a skeptic. Because he was a skeptic, he went to study it, to understand, and see if he could disprove it. He didn't go to understand, to fully understand and accept. No, he went there to understand what is that? I need to learn what's going on. And then came Leon Denis. Leon Denis came a few years after Kardec was reincarnated because the spirituality is very wise. They always have a plan B. What means it? Kardec was extremely well prepared, but when we reincarnate, when we come to Earth, we forget a lot of things we said that we would do. And because the mission was very important and very powerful, the spirituality needs to have somebody else well prepared to continue the same mission. Then came uh, Leon Denis, who was born in a very large family. He had a lot of siblings. His family was extremely poor. He educated himself. He learned alone how to read. And at the age 18, he was a salesman who traveled all over Europe. And then, one day, he saw a book, the Spirit's book, in a, in a bookstore, and then he bought it. He read it, and he got totally in love with it, and he embraced it. And when Kardec died, he was the successor of Kardec. He fully embraced the philosophy, he studied deeply, and he <clears throat> participate of a lot of mediumistic meetings to understand better, to develop new techniques, to be able to understand how, to, how the mediums were working. Oh, a very interesting thing is that these two were so well connected that you can see, this is my laser, you can see uh, the name of Kardec was Hippolyte Leon Denis Arribari. And here is the name of Leon Denis. So it's another thing just to you see that if he couldn't, this one would be able to do it. And then, this is just the chronological order of the five main books of Kardec. So in 1855, he knows the 30 table phenomena. Two years later, he codified the first book, that the Spirit's book. And here is another very interesting um, thing. In 1857, the first book, the first edition of the Spirit's book, only had 525 questions, not the 1019 of the second edition. And Kardec was publishing the book not as Alain Kardec, but as himself, as Professor Revival. And then the Spirit stopped him and told him, don't do it. And why? A lot of people think Kardec didn't want to use his own name, he didn't want to get um, um, a mixture in this new thing. No, 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 the contrary, he really wanted to use. But he was well known, he was very famous. And then people could start buying a book just because of his name. And then he didn't want this too. So he, he, he hold on, he created a lot of different questions, he analyzed all the answers, then 
the 119 questions came and the spirits told him to sign as Alan Kardec. That was one of his names when he was a druid in a previous reincarnation. And then came in 1858 to 1869, the Spiritist magazine that Kardec published with his own money. People think, oh, you know, he was uh, getting donations from everywhere. No, 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 it's exactly like nowadays. The Spiritist Center survives with a lot of difficulties. We don't really receive money from a, a no institution. The directors put their own money to keep the doors open because we want this. We want to be able to spread positiveness. We want to be able to spread this beautiful knowledge. And that's what he was doing that time. And then in 61 came the Medium's book. 64, the Gospel according to Spiritism. 65, Heaven and Hell. 68, Genesis. And when he was finishing the Genesis, the spirits came to Kardec and told him, you have to calm down. You have to stop a little bit because your health is very is in very poor quality. You cannot continue doing this because you will accelerate your process of a discarnation. And then he said, okay, I will stop a little bit. And then he started doing it slower, but his brain could never stop. So he was in bed, extremely sick, He's still answering lots of questions, receiving lots of uh, messages, translating. And then he discarnated in 69. But in 70, his wife was able to publish all this not uh, published work in the posthumous uh, works. And in 1880, Spiritism went to Brazil. And there is another book that's very, very interesting that uh, we can read exactly about this process, why Spiritism left France and went to Brazil. In, a, in, a, in this time, was in 79, was the French Revolution. A lot of hatred, a lot of terror in, uh, in France. So the energy of the whole country was very disturbed. And then in Brazil, was a very young country where a lot of uh, new spirits were reincarnating with new ideas of, uh, of religion. And also because we received the people from many different uh, cultures, the idea of religion was like something open, like it is nowadays. Nowadays, it is still like that. So the name of the book is um, Brazil. Uh, Coração. Heart of the I don't world. know in English. Heart of the world, land of the gospel. Ah, yes. Coração. Yeah, heart of the world. And land of the gospel. Land of the gospel. It's a beautiful book by the spirit of Humberto de Campos, who is a reporter, and it's a fantastic book. So here we have the base of spiritism. So the base is really these three books. The spirit's book, that's the philosophy, the medium's book, the science, and the gospel, the moral aspects of the doctrine. When we talk about medium's book as being a science, we talk about analyzing the mediumistic phenomena. That's why we mention the science. And then some different facts here. So when Kardec was first publishing um, the, when he was first publishing the book, oh no, let's talk about this first. Uh, Kardec's spiritual guide gave him a message saying this book will be of importance not only to the religious world but also to nations. So the book would have an importance that Kardec would never have imagined that was so, was going to be so much bigger than what he was thinking about. And uh, he wanted to write it called, named as Imitation of the Gospel According to Spiritism. And I went to research in that in the time of Kardec, imitation actually, actually mean equal, the same, a copy, a perfect copy, not a China copy. Now, like nowadays, we have a very poor and inferior copy of uh, some item. So what happened is that the church got extremely wild when it found out he was publishing a book called Imitation of the Gospel. So it got really dangerous to Kardec. And then his editor, Pierre Poudier, also told him he, he would have to face a lot of legal problems. 
So then Kardec said, you know, it's too confusing. Let's name it only the gospel according to the spiritism. And that's how it turned it again. And now we have to talk about uh, Jesus as the second revelation. So we have Moses, the first revelation, and Jesus, the second revelation. So we know in Spiritism that the, Jesus is the governor of the planet Earth. He actually created, he helped the planet Earth to be built. So you can imagine how many billions of years this spirit is working towards our, be our betterment. He created the land and then created us to come. And uh, his messages were the God is love, love one another, forgive your enemies. My kingdom is not from earth, and the consoler will come. A lot of people from different religions, when they read the consoler will come, they actually believed that Jesus was going to come back again, that Jesus was going to reincarnate, was going to walk on the earth in another time. But it was not that that he meant. He meant that something else was coming in order to help us. And the population was too young at that time to fully understand Jesus' teachings. So he had to talk in parables. So one time Peter went to Jesus and said, Master, why can't you talk to us directly? And to them, you have to tell stories. You have to talk in parables. And then Jesus said, because you were chosen and you were prepared ahead when you were still in the spiritual world, you fully accepted and embraced the idea that you're going to help me here. So these spirits, they were a little bit more evolved, and they were already prepared to the mission they were going to go. But there was uh, the majority, the majority was not uh, able to do it. So Jesus had to give these stories in order they could be able to connect, to understand the me. And then comes Divaldo talking that Jesus was such an important figure that he couldn't fit in the calendar. So it was created before and after. This is so powerful when you think one figure, one man could change the whole calendar of the world. This is just so touching. Another thing important about Jesus that we can't imagine is that when you read the books of, uh, of Andrea Luis, you see that uh, when uh, the spirit, normal spirit, no, no high elevation, anything, me, when uh, I was going to reincarnate on earth, I am a, a big person, and every single one of us has to shrink. Spiritually saying, our perispirit, we have our physical body and we have our perispirit and our spirit. Our perispirit has to shrink to be able to be small and then be able to connect with the wife, the wife, with the mother. So you imagine Jesus, you imagine not the size, but being this huge figure of love, this huge ball of energy that had to humble himself so much to come to a almost primitive world that was the time he reincarnated. So you can see the love that uh, he has for us. And then came the third revelation, that's the, that's the spiritism. So spiritism is our guide to reach God. And when I thought about that, I thought about a figure that touched me very much. And I gave a lecture some time ago here also that was Saul of Tarsus. So Saul of Tarsus was this man, very powerful and full of knowledge. He knew every single thing about religion. He was a very important person in the synodium of the time. But he was hard. He didn't have all this love and, and charity in his heart. So he was con combating to kill the Christians because he could not understand Jesus. He thought he was against Moses. We have to kill him. But then when he's crossing the desert to go to kill some Christians, he got blind and he saw Jesus. And then a lot of things happened, but he understood that only with the knowledge, nothing can happen. You really need knowledge, love, and charity. Then he, he 
left the religion and he embraced religiosity. And that's what we should all have, religiosity in us. So we know all the, the laws, we know everything, but we also have this love inside of us. And then my personal point of view was that the Pope of Tarsus, I see him as the third apostle because this man in his time, he crossed Europe, Asia, walking, walking. There were no cars, there was no airplane. He was walking for months to, to talk about Jesus. He was able to help a lot of countries to find out who Jesus was and his message, his loving message. And also, then, later on, came Kardec with all this, this job that is so hard for us to fully comprehend how tough it was. And Kardec came, and I see him as the fourth, 14th apostle. And finally, Chico Xavier, this great uh, Brazilian medium who was able to write uh, 412 books that uh, were from many, many different spirits. He never got any money from all the books, millions of books that were published, and he gave every single thing for charity. So because of, uh, of a Chico, spiritism got really so powerfully spread in, in Brazil. And even people of other religions that are not spiritists, they start reading the book just because of his loving figure that helped so many people that they were always there asking uh, for some kind of help and hope. And thinking about those people, I start thinking about the problems in our lives, how those people were gonna resolve the problems. Because we see them, oh, it's, for them it's so easy. Well, it could be easy for us too. What happens is that we live in the if, I call the if time. The if time because the problems we should resolve here, we should resolve in the present. A problem is happening, okay, let's do it, let's resolve it. But of course, some problems are very difficult, are very painful, so we alone, it's kind of tough. But when we have faith, when we understand the message of gospel, the message of hope, the message that everything will pass, because the problems they pass, the problems they come and they pass. Maybe they, they left the painful marks, but they will be gone one day. But the good things also, something wonderful happened, but then it will finish, and all that excitement will go away and you will remain there. So good and bad things happen, but when we are in the if time, to the past. The if that I mean is like, oh, if I had done different, if I hadn't said that, if I had uh, uh, cleaned that, whatever, the problem wouldn't have happened. But uh, we cannot change the past. If we remain thinking, if I could have done that, what I have done many times, that I felt bad about something, but it doesn't help us to be thinking the if, it already happened. So we have to stop the if, although we are going to develop guilty feelings. And the guilty feelings, they are like cancer. They don't help us to move on. We keep with that, ah, it's so awful. The same thing happens to the future. The person who has if to the future. If tomorrow the bus don't pass on time, I will be if my boyfriend leaves, how is it going to be my life? If I lose my job, what's going to happen? This is not, help, it's not helpful. This, we are going to end, end up with anxiety and stress. What I'm telling you is not just don't care about the future because this is not intelligent. And we see that the spirituality has a plan B for everything. So that's what we have to do. We have to have a plan B. If you think something is not good in your job, start preparing your resume and start sending to other places because you need to have a, a you have to have a plan B in every single thing of your life, and that's how we are going to uh, resolve our problems facing them. So the gospel, according to Spiritism, is really this manual that helps us to deal with all these negativity, these difficult uh, feelings and emotions inside of us. And the enlightened spirits, they guide us through the writings of the New Testament. So they analyze in the book, all the messages of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are 
analyzed in the gospel, and I will show how they are analyzed. But here, we see difficulties and dangers. So we see the animals. When an animal is in danger, what, the, what he does? Dark fights. Or he fights, or he fights. He runs away. Why? Because an animal has an instinct, an instinct of protection that we also have. But we are not only instinct, we are intelligence too. And instinct and intelligence is emotions. We are able to rationalize. If I am in danger, I cannot run, I cannot fight, I will talk, I will pray, I will do something. If I am facing a, a, a difficult problem and uh, I'm gonna have a huge fight, I can remember that I'm not an animal and I can remain calm and try to avoid the physical confrontation. And when we have the gospel, we learn this is a process that will start happening little by little, and one day will be natural, will be very easy. But without it, of course, it's so much dif more, more difficult. So the, the gospel brought us a new perspective to the Jesus teaching. So we analyze the New Testament, but now we analyze this understanding, reincarnation, immortality of the soul, communicability of the spirits, God's existence, the law of action and reaction, that every single thing we do, good or negative, will have a consequence. If it's good, fantastic. Will be something positive coming. But if it's negative, we have to be prepared. And that's what we should avoid. We shouldn't do negative things. But most of all, the gospel help us with comfort, console, clarification, orientation, and understanding. So this is so powerful, because when we start having this love built in us, even if when the problem happens and we still <coughs> react, because we end up reacting, we can think about it and calm down, and then what would make us to go to physical aggression, we remain calm, and we may even say, I'm sorry, I did wrong because we are understanding it. In the future, we are not gonna have any, any reaction. We will be like, a, like a, uh, I don't have much time to go into my other parts, but we will be like Gandhi. One time, uh, Gandhi was offended by um, a man, and one of his followers said, Gandhi, are you not gonna do anything? This man just, uh, just uh, badly attack you. And he said, aren't you offended? And he said, no. Because it never touched me, it never hurt me. I never had any kind of a feeling against this man because he was so much over that. He was so much more evolved than that. So this is how Kardec organized the book. The prefix that was uh, written by the Spirit of Truth who a lot of uh, people believe to be Jesus Christ himself. The introduction and the 28 chapters. 27 chapters are the explanations of Jesus' teachings, and the fifth chapter is the biggest one where uh, he analyzes the blessed are the afflicted portion. And then we have the prayer, one chapter, the final chapter, totally dedicated to prayers. Kardec knew we wouldn't know how to pray, so he's like, let me help these people because uh, if I don't do that, it's gonna be a problem. So in this beautiful chapter, they have prayers for anything you dream about. Prayers for suicidals, prayers for enemies, prayers for somebody that's sick, prayers for ourselves. So it's not that Kardec is telling you how to do it, but it's helping you, giving you an idea, is really guiding us. It's beautiful. <coughs> and here we see the importance of the introduction. Who here read the introduction? of the gospel. Only one, Where's two, three, four, five, oh, it's getting better. Six? Okay, it's getting better. From, I don't know how many, but six already read, that's fantastic. This is a fantastic portion of the, the book. A lot of people just skip it because we got it's an introduction, it's not important. It's very important. There we can, he explains, he goes explaining what's the purpose of this new philosophy. The spiritist philosophy, 
and, and then he goes explaining some words that you were used in Jesus' maxims, and also has a historical explanation of the Hebrew society and the manners and traditions of the time. This part here is very important because the Hebrew language in that time was extremely poor. One word could have like 20 different meanings depending on the context of the sentence. And uh, Haroldo Dutra Dias, he is um, a lawyer from Brazil, a very, very famous spiritist, and he is also analyzing it. He created actually the new edition of the gospel, of the gospel, no, the name new of the New Testament, where he analyzes every single thing because he translates them from the original language, not from all the translations that came to French, English. He analyzed from the original language, was Sanskrit and what else? It was like Greek and Aramaic. Greek, Aramaic, to, uh, to actually Portuguese. So it is great and that they are going to translate to English now. So here we have also these important figures that uh, Kardec did a, a summary of uh, Socrates and Plato, his uh, student and follower. So Socrates is for 400, from 469 years before Christ. And if you read his uh, philosophy, you will compare it to Jesus' teachings and to the Spiritist teachings, and it's amazing. Because Socrates spoke about communicability of spirits, of reincarnation. He spoke about the law of action and reaction, just with a little bit different words. Not the exactly same words, but if you read, you will say, whoa. And this was 469 years before Christ. Can you just imagine? So Kardec was so smart that he even brought this knowledge for us. And here's just an example of uh, the beautiful messages that the mediums received from those spirits who were so important to Christianity. All those spirits, the spirit of truth, Paul Parsons, John the Evangelist, St. Augustine, St. Francis, Xavier, St. Vincent of Paul, and so many others all brought beautiful messages for us that are in the gospel. And then you come to see the message from the spirits. It's very important for us to understand. We always say that the spiritist, he understands first and believes after. Because only when we understand the spiritism, we fully believe it. Because if we just believe in something, when somebody else comes to, to you and say, why do you believe that? Oh, because oh, I believe it, because oh, he told me. So you don't have any kind of a background to, uh, to explain. So for us, it's very important to understand why. That's why in spiritism is great when somebody say, why? I do not understand. And then we try to make the person to understand. So we see in the Bible there were many many messages from spirits. But the church analyzed it being as like something special that only happened in that time. So nowadays it cannot happen anymore. But then in the medium's book, we, we, we see all the messages the spirits brought to us. And they are so intelligent, they are so logical. And the Kardec took a long time to disprove all the crazy theories that were trying to say that uh, um, spirits, spirits' messages were impossible. So he took a long time to explain this. And then we come to nowadays with the materialistic science. And the materialistic science, we know that if they cannot touch, they cannot prove, then they don't believe it. But there are some examples of uh, famous scientists that decided to embrace this danger. And one of them is Dr. Ian Stevenson. He's from the, he discriminated, but he's from, he's from the University of Virginia, and he studied thousands of reincarnation cases. And he published many books. One of his very famous books I finished reading a few time ago, it's called 20 Cases of uh, Possible Reincarnation. 20 Cases Suggestive. Suggestive, yes, 20 Cases 
suggestive reincarnation because he didn't want to say it is happening because it wouldn't be accepted as a scientific book. And then we have uh, uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz. <coughs> He's from the University of Arizona and he researched hundreds of psychic mediums and he also studied energy healing and he published many books. So Dr. Gary Schwartz, he has a PhD from Harvard and he teaches in Yale. He teaches psychology and psychiatry. Can you just imagine how smart this guy is to be able to be uh, working and teaching the highest levels of uh, uh, universities in the United States? And uh, Dr. Uh, Harry Schwartz actually uh, worked in a way that he got the most famous mediums of the United States. And he put all of them through exhaustive study, exhaustive. I read a few of his books, and just to think about the process happened was painful. These mediums had to be through days, sitting alone, writing and talking about subjects that, that they even had no idea who they were. One of the experiences that got very famous was Deepak Chopra went back to be a subject. None of the mediums knew who was, if it uh, was a man, if it was a woman, where the subject was. And they were in different rooms, and some of them were in different states. And at the same time, in that same moment, he asked all of them to start talking about the subject. So they all started writing about the subject and what had happened. And in that time, the father of the Pak Chopra had died. And then some of the mediums, like uh, uh, John Edwards, that uh, he had a TV show, and also Alison Dubois, who actually inspired a TV show called Medium, they had amazing results. And when they interviewed uh, Deepak Chopra, he said 80% was correct. And none of them knew anything about the Pak Chopra, neither that the father had died, but they mentioned, they mentioned about it. And then we have recently this documentary that was on TV that To Heaven and Back with Anderson Cooper, maybe some of you saw it. Many doctors and patients talked about these experiences and they explained how amazing it was. And some of the doctors, they, they said they couldn't understand how that patient just woke up saying certain things that were happening in another room. How is what was possible? They couldn't understand, they couldn't say anything. But uh, this is something to show us that uh, the science is approaching, the science is arriving to a moment that they will finally have to accept it and understand that mediumship is possible. So here's some outline of the purpose of the, the gospel, the purpose of the book. So, you know, it's to make people feel better, to develop our patience, to learn how to forgive, to comprehend the important law of action and reaction. This law start making us to think, I have to do to the other what I really want somebody to do to me. So it will help us to stop doing negative things because when we put ourselves in the place of the other person, we think, that's what I would like somebody to tell me, somebody to do to me. No, so I will stop doing that. And also helps us to understand what happened after life, after this incarnated life. What happened? You know, when I was a child, I thought there is heaven, that has the, the guy in red with the fire, and there is heaven that, uh, you know, we go to, to the clouds and basically nothing happens and somebody plays some classical music. But to me, it was very boring. I, I didn't know what was worse. And the spiritism brought me this idea that is, is very interesting. So life after death, really, it's more or less what we have here. We, when we read Nosolar, we understand that the hospital, we understand that uh, it's not going to be a boring life, that we are going to be just like in, in these clouds. Actually, I was not that angel to be in the, in the, <laughs> in the heaven, but I, I was like, hey, I'm not so bad to go to, to hell either. But when we understand 
all the process that when we die, we wake up in the spiritual realm, and then we can go to study, we meet our family members who died before us. It's actually very interesting. It helps us not to be so afraid of what's going to happen. And then also helps us to pray, and you know, helps us to evolve faster because when we evolve, when we get a little bit better, we help a family member to get a little bit helper, better, we help our friends, we become better people in our jobs, and this will bring the evolution to the whole society. And here is the part that the, the gospel study group. So the gospel study group we have here every Sunday. So it's, it's, I see the, the, the studies of Sunday as this, uh, this AA, because you go there and you learn with a lot of people. You learn through the experiences of the others. You learn through the pain of the others. And then it incites us to be able to talk about our own pain, our own experiences, negative, positive, and you know, we go every time helping each other. And many times, it's very beautiful because many times uh, come these uh, this stories that are very touching. Stories of people that say, oh, before um, I really didn't know what I was going to do, or I was into drugs, or I was thinking about suicide. And then I came here and I started learning a little bit. You guys brought us to the nursing home. We visit a nursing home twice a month uh, in Brooklyn. And then when we get out of our closed world, world, when we are able to go to practice some kind of charity, when we go to visit the elderly, or when we go to visit the veterans of uh, war, when we go to any shelter, we see there's so much pain. Pain like in, in, a, in a level that we cannot understand yet. And then we start little by little forgetting about our smaller problems. And we see that uh, there are so many things that we can do to better ourselves too. There is a sentence that says that uh, uh, you are, uh, no wait. You are just alone. I don't know how to translate to English. So é solitário. No, so é solitário quem não é solidário. You are just lonely because you are not solidary. And so it means you think you are lonely, so become solidary. Embrace a cause. Start visiting a hospital. Start doing something. You will be making so many friends that you will start, you will stop thinking about your own problems and you will start donating your work, your love towards the others. And this will help you to get cured from whatever problem you are having. So the gospel is really the biggest moral code that the humanity could ever aspire to receive. The gospel, as I said in the beginning, if we, not just to read it, if we really study it, we really try to apply it to our lives. It's really going to change our lives. As I said uh, before too, it's not that uh, I read the book today and tomorrow I'm a perfect being. No, like everything in life, it just doesn't happen like that. You need the time, but it will help you to evolve. And when I said, when, uh, when we study in a group, it's, it's much more powerful. It's much different than when you are reading alone. And it pushes us to become a better person. The exchange of experience is a real healing therapy. And bringing this lo loving knowledge into our family, our friends, our society, so it's really, it's really something that we should uh, fully embrace in, in our lives. And here is something that uh, we have a group here in the center that uh, goes to your house to help you how to implement the gospel at home or the God at home. So the gospel at home is basically done once a week 
where we read the, the passage of the gospel and then we comment uh, in loud voice. And it doesn't mean that uh, you need to have a wife and a child of uh, all your roommates together. You can do it alone. I did it alone for many, many years. And my husband was there, but he didn't want to participate, so I always did it alone. Nowadays, I do it with my son and also with my husband. But, you know, you can never obligate somebody to do something that they don't want. So I always told it what, what it was to my husband. He understood it, but he always said, that's your thing. You can do it there, but I don't want to get involved. And I was like, okay, of course I tried very hard, but it never worked. So I'm like, okay, forget about it. And then one day, when he was in deep, deep pain, he was, like we say, he was deep in the hole, desperate. I was, I saw the time and I was oops, I have to go, I have to do my gospel. And then he was like, what is that thing that you do every week? Explain. I was like, wow, he's asking me a question about it? I was like, oh, <laughs> you open the door, I jump in. And they're like, oh, babe, it's fantastic. We read, we comment, there are a lot of spirits here, oh, a lot of spirits here. Uh, no, no, okay, not so many spirits here. <laughs> And then I sat in the living room, um, he's Protestant, so I asked him to start it with his, uh, his version of the uh, fathers, the, the our father, 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 the our father, and then he did it, and then I did uh, my own style of prayer, and then I asked him to open the book randomly. Like I really like to do, I like to think about something, I like to think about a problem, and the answer is always there. So he opened the book, and I asked him to read. And then he started reading, and then he's like, didn't you mark this page? I was like, no, what is about it? The page was exactly the problem he was suffering from. It was so strong that it, it struck, struck him like a lightning, zoom. He really was like in disbelief of that because it was exact, was like talking to him. So he stopped crying. He stopped crying because for so many years, he kind of made fun of what I was doing. He was actually good because he never gave me a hard time. He never forbade me. He never caused me any trouble, but he was just like, it's not for me. And from that day on, things changed and nowadays, he does it with me and my son. My son is, is hilarious because he is like the, the best uh, the best clock. The day before he's already saying, Mama, tomorrow we have the gospel. Don't forget about it. He enjoys it. He deeply embraces it. And I have also a, a personal experience about uh, the gospel. Many years ago, when I first started uh, studying, studying really, uh, spiritism, I had a big fight with my mother and father. Big fight. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. So now I'm not going to talk to them because they can never call me. It was super expensive. So I am going to go on a strike. And I'm not going to call them. And now they are going to suffer. And then the days were passing. They were suffering. Well, maybe, but I was suffering so that. I'm like, oh my God, how is my mother doing? How is my father doing? I have no idea. But I was like, I'm not going to call because they did this, this, and this to me. And then I was like, okay. And then the gospel days arrived and gone. And then this day I was in deep suffering. I was like, the problem that came to my mind was actually my mother, the one that I, I'm so connected and the one who hurt me so bad. So I was thinking, why did my mother do that to me? This is awful. I can't take it anymore. I cannot forgive her. And I opened the book. And when I opened the book, my, my book in that time was in Portuguese because I went to, I used to go to a spiritual center in a place that was in Portuguese. And then the, the first sentence was, Graça, Graça, Graça. And the name of my mother is Graça. 
So when I saw graça, 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 I had the same reaction that my father did. Who separate this page to open here? This is crazy. And then I started reading, and it was all about giving grace to everything you have, to all the love you have, to the family member that you have, to the problems that you have, to everything. Because it's through all this, through the pain, through the process, that one day we will be a better person. So when I finished the book, I was in tears. And I immediately went to the phone and I called my parents. And I have to say that we were crying. I'm always crying just to think about it. And it was so powerful because my mother immediately she started saying, I'm so sorry that I hurt you so bad. And I was too, oh, I'm so sorry that I am the horrible person. But you know, it's not that, that we get stuck in our problems and that we cannot analyze that. We hurt the other, but we are hurting too. And when we really understand it, we can avoid all these problems becoming better, learning how to say, I'm sorry. Don't do this again. Please help me to become better too. And then one day, all these problems will end. When we do the gospel, we are receiving the good spirits to help us in the house. In the books of Andrea Luis, we see that when the spirits come in missions from more elevated uh, uh, spheres, they use the, the houses who practice the spirit, uh, who practice the gospel to be able to be protected. So this protection brings this wonderful energy to our home. Then when we are studying, with our family or within ourselves, we are exchanging this knowledge, maybe just with the spirits there if you are alone, but in our daily lives, you will be spreading this knowledge to other people. And then it will benefit our home, our building, our neighborhood. All this beautiful energy will be brought to all the whole place. And then it will help us to get more connected with our guardian angel. Because when we, are, we do the gospel in a weekly basis, it's almost like a, we are constructing this, this shield of a love, this shield of a energy, healing in our home. And then that's when we come in from work with so much stress, all kinds of problems. You open the door and you say, ah, it's so good to be home. Yes, it's always wonderful to be home. But when you, you do the gospel, you feel the energy, you feel the vibration, and this vibration is very different. So if you guys want any information about how to do the gospel at home, just contact our friend, our friend Fred, and he will help you. But the most important of all is to understand that we are Jesus' children. And even if we are adults now, spiritually, we are still children. We are still little children that need a lot of love, a lot of console. But we also need to make our effort. We need to take our part, doing the best we can, using our free will to go the correct path towards the master. And the master is just love. Thank you.